Hi, Dennis. Hey, Sam. You know, I was just watching a documentary on tigers. They were saying that tigers are on the brink of extinction. If measures are not taken, soon we may not have any tigers left. How's that possible? Sadly enough, tigers have been hunted down over the last few decades and many of them don't find partners to reproduce to keep the species alive. I don't really understand. What is reproduction? Yes, yes, Hexy. I can understand why you are confused. Robos have no need to reproduce because they are created by man. But living organisms on Earth need to reproduce to keep their species alive. It's because of reproduction that you see millions of organisms of the same type. In this lesson, you will learn about the significance of reproduction. At the end of this lesson, you will be able to Describe the significance of reproduction. So, as I was saying earlier, organisms reproduce to keep the species alive. For example, if tigers don't reproduce, we won't be able to see any more tigers in a few years. So, reproduction makes a new individual? You got it. But wait a minute, Sam. How did dinosaurs become extinct then? Didn't they reproduce? Well, there is another aspect to survival of a species. Environments can change drastically without the control of organisms. Such an environmental change can kill a species. Scientists say that the earth was hit by meteorites that led to the end of the dinosaurs. Hmm. You know, the documentary also showed how human beings evolved from apes. But you said, reproduction produces organisms of similar type. So how do features of organisms change through evolution? You have to understand that evolution is a long drawn out process that takes place over millions of years. Organisms live together in a well defined environment. During reproduction, these organisms produce body design features suitable for that environment. For example, over generations, giraffes developed long necks to eat the leaves growing high up on trees. How do they change their body design on their own? Well, it is a little different from the way we designed you, for sure. The answer lies in variations produced during DNA replication. You must have studied at school about how chromosomes in the nucleus of a cell carry information for the inheritance of features from parents to the next generation in the form of DNA. Dioxyribonucleic acid molecules. So, what happens during reproduction is that a DNA copy is created. In replication, the DNA is not identically copied. This leads to variations in the DNA. During reproduction, these variations are passed on to the offspring and then to the subsequent generations. Such variations can help a species survive adverse conditions. It is confusing, Sam. Let me explain this with an example. Suppose there was a population of bacteria living in temperate waters and the temperature increases due to global warming. Many of the bacteria would die due to the increased temperature. However, DNA variations in some bacteria might enable them to develop resistance to heat. The DNA of these heat-resistant bacteria are then passed on to its offspring and subsequent generations that lead to the heat-resistant bacteria. DNA seems to be very powerful. Yes, they sure are. So. That's what they mean by survival of the fittest. Exactly. Just like we keep building better models of machines. Nature enables living organisms to evolve into stronger beings through DNA variations. This brings us to the end of this lesson 
on reproduction and its significance. In the next lesson, you will learn about modes of reproduction in living organisms. To revisit the key points covered in this lesson, please review the flashcard at the end of this lesson. Hi, I'm Miss Curious. I live in your mind. I question things. That's how you learn and grow. Wondering what I'm doing here? You know, she says that a lot of plants require only one parent plant to reproduce. She's planting some flowers and vegetables today. So I thought I can tag along. Shh! Here comes Arnold. Hi, Mom. The garden looks so colorful. And what are you planting this season? Well, just some roses, some pumpkins and potatoes for the vegetable patch. You know, it's very interesting how you use seeds to plant pumpkins, but a stem for a rose plant. And it looks like you are using whole potatoes too. That's true. But can you recall ever seeing a rose seed? Or a potato seed for that matter? No, I can't. You're right. They don't seem to have seeds at all, do they? These plants have lost their capacity to produce seeds. That's why sexual reproduction is not possible in these plants. So, they use their vegetative parts to reproduce. It's an interesting phenomenon because not many animals can reproduce this way. In fact, depending on their body designs, various organisms reproduce in different modes. It's an interesting study. In this lesson, you will learn about the modes of reproduction in plants. At the end of this lesson, you will be able to List the modes of reproduction in living organisms. Explain how the mode of reproduction of an organism is related to its body design. Explain how unicellular organisms reproduce by fission. And illustrate the types of asexual reproduction in multicellular organisms. Fragmentation, Regeneration, Budding, Vegetative Propagation, and Spore Formation. We were talking about reproduction and body designs of organisms. At a very basic level, let's consider unicellular and multicellular organisms. Now, let's relate the body designs to modes of reproduction. Living organisms can reproduce in two modes, asexual and sexual. The asexual mode of reproduction is when a single individual is responsible for creating a new generation of species. For example, new plants are grown without the production of seeds. The sexual mode of reproduction, on the other hand, requires two individuals to create a new generation of that species. So, the germ cells of two parent plants are combined to create the seed for a new plant. That's how human beings and animals reproduce. In plants, this mode of reproduction produces seeds which lead to new plants. See that hibiscus plant. Hibiscus cannabinus uses the asexual as well as sexual mode of reproduction. Let's first look at the simpler mode of reproduction, that is, the asexual mode. 
the asexual mode of reproduction can take many forms. Fission, fragmentation, regeneration, budding, vegetative propagation, and spore formation. Wow! So many ways of reproduction. True. But let's begin at the very beginning. Can you think of a simple unicellular organism? How about amoeba? Good example. Amoeba is a unicellular organism that reproduces by cell division. You mean a cell dividing into two or more cells? Exactly. It is also called fission. The mother cells divide to form the daughter cells. Many different patterns of fission have been observed in amoeba. In fact, in organisms like amoeba, the splitting of the two cells during division can take place on any plane. This is called transverse binary fission. Oh, so do all unicellular organisms reproduce like that? Not really. Let's look at a unicellular organism that has a more organized body design. For example, the Leishmania. Leishmania have a whip-like structure at one end of the cell. Binary fission occurs in a definite orientation in relationship to the whip-like structures. Leishmania? The name sounds very familiar. Probably because it causes black fever. Oh! Interestingly, the malarial parasite, Plasmodium, is also a unicellular organism. Plasmodium, however, reproduces by multiple fission. That is, it divides into many daughter cells simultaneously. Amazing how dangerous these small unicellular organisms can be. Not always, though. Yeast is also a unicellular organism. Yeast, by the way, produces small buds that separate and grow further. And how about multicellular organisms? Do any of them reproduce like unicellular organisms do? Well, multicellular organisms can reproduce asexually as well as sexually. But to answer your question, some of the reproductive methods used by unicellular organisms do work with multicellular organisms that have relatively simple body organization. Remember the slimy filamentous green masses that you can see developing on the surfaces of some ponds? That's Spirogyra. Spirogyra reproduces by fragmentation. It simply breaks up into smaller pieces upon maturation. Ah, so each piece or fragment grows into a new individual. That's right. What about other multicellular organisms? Why can't they reproduce by fragmentation? Because they are not just a random collection of cells. They consist of specialized cells organized as tissues. Tissues are organized into organs placed at definite positions on the body of the organism. Cell by cell division wouldn't lead to another individual in such cases. Like human beings. Can you imagine a brain cell breaking off and developing into a complete human body? 
Um, no. I see what you mean. So what happens in reproduction of such organisms? They use more complex ways of reproduction. There is typically a single cell type in the organism that is capable of growing, multiplying and creating other cell types under appropriate conditions. This can happen through regeneration, budding, vegetative propagation and spore formation. Regeneration involves development of new individuals from body parts. For example, consider fully differentiated organisms such as hydra or planaria. These can be cut or broken down into many pieces. Each of these cut pieces can grow into separate individuals. How does that happen? Remember I was telling you that multicellular organisms have specialized cells for reproduction? Yes, that's right. So specialized cells are involved in regeneration. Exactly. These cells proliferate into a large number of cells. From this mass of cells, different cells undergo changes to become various cell types and tissues. I can't imagine an organism depending on being cut up to be able to reproduce. Can you? Regeneration is actually not the same as reproduction. I decided to read up a bit more on it and found that hydra and planaria can reproduce in other ways as well. By the way, regeneration is also called morphalexis. Hmm. So if not cut up, how would an organism like hydra reproduce? Good question. Organisms like hydra can also reproduce by budding. They use regenerative cells for reproduction in the process of budding. How's that? In hydra, a bud develops as an outgrowth due to repeated cell division at a specific site. Each such bud develops into tiny individual hydra. Oh, so I guess they detach from the parent body when fully mature and become independent individuals? Exactly. Now let's get back to your original question about what I'm planting here. Can you tell me which out of these plants reproduces asexually? I guess the rose plant. You planted just the stem. That's right. Rose plants reproduce through vegetative propagation. Vegetative propagation involves production of new plants using the vegetative parts of an existing plant. Can you recall some other plants where the stem is used for vegetative propagation? Mm, let me think. That looks like something you could grow from a stem. How about sugarcane? Very good. You can grow a new sugarcane plant from a part of the stem of the parent plant. In fact, a similar method of vegetative propagation can be used for bananas, oranges and grapes. But what's that you have there? You seem to have tied two row stems together. Oh, that's called grafting. Through grafting, you can take vegetative propagation one step further and get some desirable characteristics in your plant. In grafting, the tissues of one plant are encouraged to fuse with those of another. 
I grafted the stems of roses of two different colors. I'm hoping to get a rose in a different shade as the characteristics of the two roses combine through grafting. You know, grafting is used in some interesting ways. Sometimes, gardeners graft related potatoes and tomatoes so that both are produced on the same plant, one above the ground and one under the ground. An amazing concept, isn't it? That sounds really cool. But how about propagation through a leaf or a bud? Come over here. Let me show you. This is a bryophyllum leaf. See the buds on the tip of this leaf? When this leaf touches moist soil, each bud grows into a new plantlet. These plantlets eventually drop off and root. Wow! That could produce a lot of plants. But let's go in for a bit. I am hungry. Can I have some butter toast? Quite a few plants here. Now, do any of these propagate like the rose plant? Let's see. Marigold requires seeds. Hmm, how about the money plant? Of course, I have seen Arnold's mom put a stem of a money plant in a bottle of water and it grows into a plant. And the good thing about it is that a money plant can be planted around the year. But be careful when taking a cutting. Look for the nodes which have roots coming out of them. These are easier to plant and they have more chances of growing. Let's now get back to Arnold and his mom. Can you guess which other food plant propagates using its buds? Your favorite vegetable, potatoes. Potato itself is a horizontal plant stem with shoots and roots usually underground. Thus the stem serves as a reproductive structure. Such horizontal underground plant stems are called rhizomes. Look at this potato here. See those buds and notches? If you cut a potato into small pieces, each with a bud or a notch, and place them on a moist cotton piece, each piece could produce a new rhizome in a few days. That's quick. Don't seeds take a long time to produce new plants? They do. Vegetative propagation is generally faster than sexual reproduction. That's one of its advantages. Can you think of other advantages of vegetative propagation? Well, it requires only one parent, doesn't it? Good observation. But there's more. Let's figure out what the other advantages can be. Remember plants like bananas and roses have lost the capacity to produce seeds. Vegetative propagation helps in reproduction of such plants. Lastly, observe this rose plant and its parent plant. Can you make out any significant differences? Not really, right? Plants produced through vegetative propagation are genetically similar enough to the parent plant to have all its characteristics. Okay, now for your breakfast. And where's the bread? Here it is. 
Looks like we forgot to keep it in the fridge last night. It seems to have something growing on it. Uh-oh, we can't use this bread. It's gone moldy because we left it outside in moist air. This stuff is called mold? In biological terms, it's called a rhizopus. Rhizopus is a simple multicellular organism. Rhizopus or bread mold can grow when bread is exposed to moist air. Remember I told you there are two methods of asexual reproduction in plants? Yes, of course. One is vegetative propagation and the other is through spores. Very good. The growth of this mold is an example of asexual reproduction through spore formation. Let's see if we can identify the specific reproductive parts of this rhizopus. Take a close look at this mold. It grows on the bread in the form of bread-like structures called hyphae. So where are the spores that help it reproduce? See those tiny blob on a stick kind of structures? Yes, they seem similar to the stamen that we see in flowering plants. These blobs are known as sporangia and these are the structures involved in reproduction. They contain cells or spores that can eventually develop into new rhizopus individuals. These spores are very light. They are covered by thick walls that protect them. So how exactly do these spores develop into new rhizopus? When the sporangia mature, they release spores. These spores keep floating in the air and eventually attach themselves to a surface that is moist and then they start growing. Can you figure out which of the plants here reproduces with the help of spores? Let me see. Don't these ferns have spores? Correct. A fern is a rhizopus that uses spores to reproduce. Now, since there's no bread, let me make you some pancakes for breakfast. Well, let's leave Arnold to enjoy his breakfast. Meanwhile, I have some more interesting information for you. I read about a new advancement in technology that gives us another asexual method for the propagation of plants, tissue culture. The interesting thing about tissue culture is that it enables us to produce exact copies of plants in sterile conditions. Just think, this technique can enable production of exact copies of plants in the absence of seeds, help us produce plants from seeds that otherwise have very low chances of germinating and growing. For example, in the case of orchids and nepenthes. Enable us to clean a plant of viral and other infections and quickly multiply. Let's take a quick look at how tissue culture is done. Tissue or separating cells are removed from the growing tip of a plant. The removed cells are placed in an artificial medium where they divide rapidly to form a small group of cells called callus. The callus is transferred to another medium that contains hormones for growth and differentiation. Here, each callus grows into a plantlet. Each plantlet is then placed in the soil so that it can grow into a mature plant. So, that was a great session on methods of reproduction in living organisms, wasn't it? 
You learnt about the various methods of asexual reproduction in unicellular as well as multicellular organisms. To revisit the key points covered in this lesson, please review the flashcard at the end of this lesson. When germ cells from two individuals combine during sexual reproduction, a new individual is formed. In simple organisms, two germ cells may be quite similar to one another. In complex organisms, though, the germ cells are more specialized. One germ cell is large and stores food, while the other is smaller and motile. This motile germ cell is the male gamete, and the larger germ cell is the female gamete. This differentiation in germ cells needs the female and male reproductive organs to be different. This leads to dissimilarities in the bodies of male and female animals. This lesson describes the male and the female reproductive system in animals, specifically in human beings. It also explains the process of reproduction and the importance of reproductive health. At the end of this lesson, you will be able to identify the parts of the male reproductive system, identify the parts of the female reproductive system, describe the process of fertilization, and list various sexually transmitted diseases. Before we begin this lesson, let me introduce you to Eva and Spark, who will guide you through this lesson. Hi, I'm Spark. And I am Eva. All of us know that our bodies change as we become older. Our height increases as we move from one class to the next. Similarly, our weight increases as we grow. These changes make the body become larger in size. In the early teenage years of boys and girls, sperm and eggs are formed in the male and the female reproductive systems, respectively, in an unripe state. During this phase, a whole new set of body changes occur that are common to both boys and girls. This may involve changes in the appearance and proportion of the body, emergence of new features and the development of new sensations. During this phase, boys and girls will notice hair growth in certain parts of the body, such as armpits, legs, face, arms and the genital areas. At this time, the skin too frequently becomes oily and might develop pimples. All these changes take place slowly over a period of months and years. The time taken for these changes to occur differs from person to person. These changes are aspects of the sexual maturity of the body. So how do all these changes link with the reproductive process or even to our existence? As you know, the process of fertilization involves the fusion of germ cells. But this fusion is possible only once the male germ cells and the female germ cells are mature. Thus, sexual maturity of the body is necessary for the process of fertilization to happen. During the teenage phase, the growth in the body of the boy and the girl slows down. In the adolescent phase, the reproductive tissues begin to mature. This period in boys and girls is called puberty. During this phase of puberty, 
sexual reproduction in humans is possible. But for that, presence of a male reproductive system and a female reproductive system similar to the stamen and the carpel in flowering plants is necessary. The sperm forms a part of the male reproductive system. While the egg forms a part of the female reproductive system. The male reproductive system consists of sections that produce germ cells like sperm, while other sections take up the task of delivering them to the site of fertilization. In males, the germ cells known as sperms are formed in the testes located outside the abdominal cavity in the scrotum. These sperms have a long tail that helps them move towards the female germ cell. But why does this formation happen outside the abdominal cavity? This is because the sperm formation requires a lower temperature than the normal body temperature. But the other obvious question is, how does sperm end up meeting the egg if they are placed somewhere below the abdominal cavity? Like I said earlier, there are a lot of organs in the reproductive system that help sperm to develop and later travel to meet the egg. Let me explain this in detail. After the sperms are formed, their development is regulated by the hormone testosterone. It not only regulates but also helps in the development of the secondary sexual characters leading to puberty. The sperms use the help of the vas deferens which joins another tube that emerges out of the urinary bladder. As the germ cells move along the path of the vas deferens, glands like the prostate and the seminal vesicles add their secretions so that these cells make the transportation easier. The sperms then pass through the urethra and through the penis to reach the female reproductive system where the sperm gets to meet the egg. What is the vas deferens used for? The vas deferens continues from epididymis as a tube. The length of the tube is about 30 centimeters and it is muscular. The muscles in the walls help to propel the sperm forward. What secretions are made by the glands? The secretions from the seminal vesicle contain proteins, enzymes, fructose, mucus, vitamin C, flavins, phosphorylcholine, prostaglandins. The secretion from the prostate gland comprises simple sugars and is alkaline in nature. The urethra forms a common passage for both the sperm and urine as it is just one tube that connects the glands, the bladder and the vas deferens. Now, let's move over to the female reproductive system. In females, germ cells develop into eggs inside the ovaries. Females are born with a large number of immature eggs. On puberty, these eggs mature and are responsible for producing some hormones. During puberty, some of these eggs start maturing. Every month, one egg is produced by one of the ovaries. This egg is carried from the ovary to the womb through a thin ovi duct also known as fallopian tube. The two ovi ducts unite into an elastic bag-like structure 
known as the uterus. The uterus opens into the vagina through the cervix. How does fertilization take place? Sperms enters through the vaginal passage during sexual intercourse. They then travel upwards and reach the oviduct where they get to meet the egg. Fertilization takes place here. After fertilization takes place, the fertilized egg, also known as the zygote, starts dividing and gets implanted in the lining of the uterus. As the mother's body is designed to undertake the development of the child, the uterus prepares itself by thickening its lining. The uterus is richly supplied with blood to nourish the growing embryo. The embryo gets nutrition from the mother's blood with the help of a special tissue called placenta. So, what is a placenta? And how is it helpful? It is a disc which is embedded in the uterine wall. It contains villi on the embryo side of the tissue. On the mother's side are blood spaces which surround the villi. This provides a large surface area for glucose and oxygen to pass from the mother to the embryo. The developing embryo will also generate waste substances which can be removed by transferring them into the mother's blood through the placenta. The development of the child inside the mother's body takes approximately 9 months. The child is born as a result of the rhythmic contractions of the muscles in the uterus. Now, isn't that incredible? This fusion of the sperm and the egg has resulted in the formation of a new life form. It is not always necessary that the fusion between the sperm and egg takes place. However, the uterus creates a thick lining to support the fertilized egg every month. If the egg does not get fertilized, this lining is not needed and hence it slowly breaks and comes out through the vagina as blood and mucus. This cycle takes place roughly every month and is known as menstruation. It usually lasts for about 2 to 8 days. All of you may have pressures from external sources to indulge in sexual acts or get married and have children. But you must understand the consequences it may have on your health. A sexual act always has the potential to cause a pregnancy. Pregnancy makes major demands on the body and the mind of a woman. And if she's not prepared for it, her health may be adversely affected. So, how does one avoid the situation? During intercourse, there are some mechanical barriers that prevent the sperm from reaching the egg. Contraceptive devices like a loop or copper tea are placed in the uterus to block the passage of sperm. At the same time, contraceptive drugs could also be taken orally as pills to avoid pregnancy. Since these drugs change the hormonal balances in the woman, they could cause some side effects like weight gain, depression, vomiting, and high blood pressure. Apart from contraceptives, surgical methods can also be used to create blocks in the man and the woman and to prevent the transfer of sperm and egg cells. In males, the vast difference is blocked to prevent the passage of sperm. In females, the oviduct is blocked 
to prevent the passage of eggs. These methods have side effects too. Hence, it is better to use a condom. During sex, there is close contact between bodies. Hence, this could result in the transmission of sexually transmitted diseases. Bacterial infections such as gonorrhea and syphilis and viral infections such as warts and HIV or AIDS are some of the diseases that are transmitted sexually. AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, is the infection that is causing havoc in humans today. Using a condom for the male reproductive organ during sexual intercourse helps prevent transmission of many of these infections to some extent. However, it fails if it is not used properly. Unlike most animals, plants are capable of propagating a new generation of their species without seed. That is, they are capable of asexual reproduction. Like human beings and animals, plants can also reproduce sexually to produce seeds that give rise to a new generation. In this lesson, you will learn about sexual reproduction in flowering plants. At the end of this lesson, you will be able to Identify the importance of sexual reproduction List the reproductive parts in flowering plants Explain the steps involved in the process of sexual reproduction in flowering plants and explain the concept of germination. Arnold has been learning about the world of plants through his mom's garden. They have had some interesting discussions about asexual reproduction in plants. It's another sunny day and he is back in his favorite place the garden in the backyard. Let's see what mysteries he unfolds today. Wow! Look at those hibiscus flowers. Beautiful! Hey mom! I've got some yellow stuff on my fingers. That must be pollen from the flowers. You remember I was telling you that it is the sexual mode of reproduction found in the hibiscus. Pollen is a coarse powder that carries the male gamete of the seed plants to the female part of the flower. You know, I was reading up about reproduction in plants and I came across some interesting stuff. Considering that many plants reproduce asexually as well, I wonder why sexual reproduction is required at all. What advantages does it provide over asexual reproduction? Well, asexual reproduction does not always provide enough DNA variation for the survival of a species. You may remember that chromosomes in the nucleus of a cell contain information for inheritance of features from parents to the next generation in the form of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid molecules. A basic event in reproduction is the creation of a DNA copy. Cells use chemical reactions to build copies of their DNA. Oh, I guess that's why children resemble their parents. Correct. In the process of copying the DNA, variations are produced. Sexual reproduction provides greater DNA variations. Hence, the offsprings produced through sexual reproduction are better suited for survival and provide a mechanism for selective adaptation to occur. 
For example, over generations, short-necked giraffes evolved to long-necked giraffes because their food was available only high up on the trees. Offsprings produced through sexual reproduction may be less susceptible to certain diseases. For example, tomatoes may gain resistance to bacterial diseases over generations through sexual reproduction. Did that sound complicated? Let me explain further. Organisms that reproduce asexually tend to multiply quickly. However, they rely on mutation for variations in their DNA. Therefore, all members of the species have similar vulnerabilities. In fact, some organisms may be unable to reproduce further when their nuclei become weak due to repeated asexual reproduction. For example, paramecium, which can reproduce by binary fission, can face this problem. On the other hand, organisms that reproduce sexually yield a smaller number of offspring. But these offspring have greater DNA variations. Why is that? The new individual or the offspring derives half the amount of DNA from the female gamete and the other half from the male gamete. Thus, sexual reproduction ensures a mixing of the gene pool of the species and due to genetic recombination during meiosis, greater variations occur. DNA variations do not occur in the asexual method due to the lack of the gamete formation. This is what makes them more suited for survival in adverse conditions. For example, your dad has diabetes, but I don't. So, you only have 50% chance of inheriting the disease from him. Now, Let's look at how the mixing of the gene pool occurs in flowering plants or angiosperms. In flowering plants, the reproductive parts of these plants are located in the flower. A flower comprises of sepals, petals, stamen, and carpels. Stamens and the carpels are the reproductive parts of a flower which contain germ cells. Germ cells help in reproduction. So, every flower has stamens as well as carpels? Not necessarily. Flowers can be bisexual as well as unisexual. A unisexual flower contains either stamens or carpels. For example, papaya and watermelon are unisexual flowers. A bisexual flower is one which contains stamens as well as carpels. For example, hibiscus and mustard flowers are bisexual. So how do the male and female germ cells come together to form the embryo? Let's use the hibiscus flower to understand the process. This is the stamen, the male reproductive part of a flower. It consists of the filament and anther. The filament is the stalk of the anther. 
the anther produces yellowish pollen grains from the pollen sacs inside it. That's the yellow stuff that you got on your hands when you touched the flower. In the same way, when an anther brushes against an insect, say a butterfly, some pollen grains stick to the insect. For fertilization, these pollen grains need to be transferred to a stigma. This process of transfer of pollen grains from the anther to the stigma is known as pollination. Stigma of the same flower or a different flower? Well, in bisexual flowers it could happen both ways. If this transfer of pollen occurs in the same flower, it is referred to as self-pollination. On the other hand, if the pollen is transferred from one flower to another, it is known as cross-pollination. So how exactly does pollen reach the female reproductive part of another flower? Through agents like wind, water, animals, birds, insects, and of course, human beings. Ah, human beings like me? Ha, yes, you could be an agent too. See that butterfly sitting on the flower? Butterflies often take these pollen grains to the female reproductive part or the carpel of another flower. You know, I was wondering what exactly attracts agents like the butterfly to these flowers. I read up a bit and this is what I found. We spoke about petals earlier, remember? Petals function to attract insects or bird pollinators through color, scent and nectar, which may be secreted in some part of the flower. For example, hibiscus petals use vibrant colors as well as nectar to attract pollinating agents such as hummingbirds. Flowers pollinated by night visitors such as bats or moths are likely to concentrate on scent, which can attract pollinators in the dark rather than color. Most flowers with such a scent are white. In fact, the characteristics that attract pollinators account for the popularity of flowers and flowering plants among humans. Now let's get back to the female reproductive part of the flower. A carpel is located in the center of a flower and comprises of three parts. The ovary, the style and the stigma. Let's look at the carpel closely. The terminal part is the stigma. Try touching this stigma. It's a little sticky, isn't it? True. Can you guess why it needs to be sticky? Oh, to catch the pollen grains, of course. That's right. When the butterfly carries the pollen grains from the stamen, the stigma can trap these pollen grains in its sticky surface. Then they can travel down to the ovary for fertilization. So the middle elongated part of the carpel is the style and this swollen part at the bottom is the ovary? Yes, you got it. Now let's look at the ovary. The ovary contains ovules and each ovule has an egg cell. Now that the stigma of the hibiscus flower has received pollen grains, 
these grains have to reach the female germ cells which are in the ovary. So, do the pollen grains just fall through the style to reach the ovary? Not quite. To enable the pollen grains to reach the female germ cells, a tube grows out of the pollen grain and reaches the ovary. This tube is known as the pollen tube. This is where the fusion of the germ cells or fertilization takes place. During fertilization, the male germ cell produced by pollen grain fuses with the female germ cell present in the ovule. This fusion of two gametes or germ cells is also called syngamy. Syngamy produces a zygote which is capable of growing into a new plant. So then the seeds that we see are zygotes. Not so fast. After fertilization, the zygote divides several times to form an embryo within the ovule. The ovule then develops a tough coat and is gradually converted into a seed. These are the seeds that we use to raise new plants. But the seed is not available to us just yet. It is enclosed in the ovary that grows rapidly and ripens to form a fruit. In this process, the petals, sepals, stamens, style and stigma may shrivel and fall off. The seed inside the fruit contains the future plant or embryo which develops into a seedling under appropriate conditions. Take a look at this hibiscus plant. Fertilization has taken place and the sepals, petals, stamens, style and stigma have withered away. But the seeds are still alive. Wow! It's become very windy. That's nature's way of dispersing the seeds of a plant. The wind will carry the seeds away and strew them on the ground somewhere else, ready to germinate and form new plants in suitable conditions. Hmm! Suitable conditions for germination, huh? Actually, once the seed is covered by soil, the basic conditions typically required for germination are nutrients, water, oxygen and proper temperature. Germination begins when the seed starts growing. The first phase shows the embryo's cell enlarging. The seed coat then breaks and the main root emerges. This is then followed by the development of the shoot that contains the stem and the leaves. Are you wondering where the zygot gets the energy to break out of the seed and grow? It derives nutrition from the endosperm or the nutritive tissues surrounding the cell. As it is the rainy season, the earth is wet and perfect for cultivation. So, happy gardening! This is the end of our discussion on sexual reproduction in flowering plants. In this lesson, you learnt about the importance of sexual reproduction, the reproduction parts of a flower, and the process of reproduction in a flowering plant. To revisit the key points covered in this lesson, Please review the flashcard at the end of this lesson.